Thank you very much for coming. <coughs> so we're, we're working on transdisciplinary approaches and we already said that transdisciplinary approaches require communication uh, across the disciplines and understanding of what the other disciplines have to offer and also understanding of what are the limitations of the other disciplines. And so it's, it's really uh, when, you, when you start working interdisciplinary or transdisciplinary is that you realize what are all your assumptions in your own discipline. Uh, what are your methods? What are your assumptions? What are your paradigms? What are the ways that you see the world? What are the ways that you think that it's valid to gather knowledge? And, um, and each discipline is a little different. And I'm going to talk kind of in general about what we call natural sciences, which it's really, you know, basically anything that's not social science. So it includes agriculture, agronomy, engineering, physics, chemistry, biology, um, ecology, agroecology, I don't know, I mean like more the, the biophysical um, uh, sciences, but also some of these things apply to the part of the quantitative uh, social sciences too. But so, um, so I'm going to try to clearly explain how I think and how I do research in my discipline uh, and hopefully that would help to understand, uh, again, as I said, some of the discussions, and I'm going to use a, 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 a quick example of that. So we start with a problem or a question um, that we want to answer, uh, or a problem that we need to solve. And and sometimes, uh, you know, it, it's more from engineering disciplines to start with a problem, and more from maybe more basic natural sciences to start with a question. But there's something we need to answer. And we come up with a hypothesis or a possible answer to that question, okay? And the, the idea that we start with that hypothesis and that we do hypothesis-driven research is that our efforts are going to try to either provide evidence to support that answer, to support that hypothesis, or provide evidence to reject that hypothesis, okay? And, and that's why hypotheses are statements that can, can be rejected. So you have a, a good hypothesis is, is a statement that you can say that's not true. Okay? If you cannot say that's not true, then it's not a hypothesis. Okay? Um, then in order to gather information and evidence to reject or accept that hypothesis, we uh, design an experiment, okay? And there's actually two ways to go about this, design an experiment or you could survey and, and, and uh, sample in different places without an experimental design, but I'm just gonna focus on the experimental design because I wanna make sure we, are, we keep inside the box. Um, we design that experiment to gather the information, then we go, we conduct the experiment, we gather data, uh, we collect uh, variables, we collect numbers, uh, we measure all those variables, and then we analyze that data. And, and that's a key role of the statistics as a discipline, to help us analyze the data. And, and the main thing that I think is behind this, 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 um, this process is that um, one of the main assumptions of, of natural scientists is that we don't really trust people. You know, that's, that's the problem, okay? So we want to make sure that we as scientists are not biasing our research, that we as scientists are not uh, making something that, you know, uh, biases the results of our, of our research because we want to be objective, okay? And, uh, and that's why we collect a lot of data and we process it in a way that anybody else could do it and get the same, the same conclusion. Okay, that's, that's the assumption. So once we got that information, we analyze the data and we find whether we can, we have enough information, we have enough evidence to support our hypothesis or we, we, find in, we don't find enough evidence to support that hypothesis and therefore we reject it, okay? And then, we think that because we did that, that's kind of true, and then we generalize it, 
and we apply to sometimes outside the realm of what those data was generated. That's somewhat problematic. Um, and usually we try to include that information that we generate into models, which are mathematical equations that can be used to predict uh, behavior of the system in the future, okay? So that's in a nutshell how we think, and we're gonna go over again over the assumptions at the end, but um, the idea is thinking about, for instance, the experiment we're gonna uh, be visiting today. Um, we have that question, what is the effect of livestock grazing management on animal productivity? So it's like, we wanna compare two different ways of grazing okay, uh, a pasture, uh, a grassland, and we want to know if those two different ways of grazing, the continuous grazing and the rotational grazing, produce more grass and if they produce more animal weight, okay, if the animals eat more and get fatter and therefore we produce more meat, okay. That's a basic question behind that, that experiment, okay. And so, the hypothesis we have, because of reading literature and, 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 and studying about grazing systems, is that the rotational grazing, because we're rotating the animals and we're providing more time for the grasses to recover, um, that rotational grazes produces more forage than the continuous grazing, okay? And the second question, the second hypothesis is that rotational grazes pr grazing produces more meat than the continuous grazing, okay? That's, that's, those are our hypotheses. Are we okay with the hypothesis or are there questions? Okay, so basically our hypothesis is that, you know, having the animals in one paddock all together is gonna produce less forage and less meat than having the animals rotate across the paddocks, okay? So how are we gonna test that hypothesis? Well, we're gonna design an experiment, okay? We could. We could go and ask the farmers what you think, okay, but we're, we're not doing that because we don't trust people. We are going to collect our own data in a way that anybody else can collect that data. And so these are the key concepts of an experiment. One is the treatment. What is that thing that we're managing that it's gonna affect the results or we, we, we think that it's gonna affect the results. So in this case, our treatment is our grazing management, okay? We have a response variable, okay, like forage production and animal production, animal weight gain. And we have experimental units that in this case in, 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 in field research we call them plots, okay, but it could be petri dishes if you're in the lab or it could be um, any, any, any different, I mean, plant pots if we, apply, if we plant seeds in, in little pots or um, you know, it can be any um, unit that we apply the treatments, okay? But we also have in any experiment variables that we can't control, okay? The treatment is the variable that we control, okay? We're gonna assign animals continuously grazing here and we're gonna assign animals um, rotationally grazing here, but there's other things that we don't control. We don't control if the soil is exactly the same in the two places. We don't control if the temperature, I mean, maybe there's some shadow from some trees on some area and, and it's affecting that, or maybe some area, it rained a little bit more on that area than on this. I mean, there's some other things that we don't control, the soil, the climate, the other things. And that's what we call the error, okay? Because we don't control it, we cannot, um, we know it's there, but we don't, we don't control it. So in, in this experiment, again, the treatment is the continuous versus rotational grazing. The response is forage productivity and animal productivity, and the experimental unit is our paddock where we assign that, okay? So um, what happens if we go to the experimental station and we say, okay, let's take one paddock of continuous grazing, one paddock of rotational grazing, and we measure that, okay? Is, is do you think that that's gonna give us the answer to provide enough information to say conventional uh, uh, continuous grazing is better or worse than rotational grazing? Right, we have one paddock here and one paddock there. No, why not? Do 
You need more plots. Why you need more plots? I agree. You need more plots, but why? To be representative of the place you study. Why, why you want to be representative? I totally agree, I totally agree. Um, so what would make that to be not true? If the continuous grazing was uh, you know, 50 kilos and the rotational grazing was 70, what would make it not true? What, what could be that it's messing my results up? Why not? Because there are other variables that I didn't control, and maybe maybe this one was in the soil that was better, and then the result is because it, the soil was better, not because of the grazing I did. So the first principle of experimental design is replication. We need several replicated units, okay? And if you talk to statistic, stati statisticians, they'll tell you the more the better, okay? And then you go to your budget and you say, well, but you know, the more, the more expensive. So there's always a trade-off between how many uh, replications and how much money you have for the experiment. But you need a replication in order to measure that error, okay? Uh, now, imagine we go now and we have replications and we have six replications of the continuous grazing and six replications of the uh, uh, rotational grazing and we run the experiment, that experiment just like it's there laid out, and we have that in average the continuous uh, grazing got you know, 50 kilos of uh, beef production and the, the other one got 70 kilos. Do you trust that? Now we have replications. Is that enough? Could there be anything there messing up my results? Yes, Alex. So, so if I put the plots like that, you know, maybe still this side of the field had more nutrients because previously it was a, an alfalfa field and it had a lot of nitrogen, and on the other side it was a, an, an old grass pasture and, and it didn't have mo much nitrogen, and so we could still have some area of the field that is better than the other and, and it could be messing up my, my results, right? So the second principle of experimental design is randomization. We need to assign the experiment, the, the treatments to the experimental units at random, okay? It's not that we just need to mix it up a little bit. It's we need to do it at random, again, because we don't trust anybody, right? And so the only thing we trust is randomness. It's like, we could have said, well, there might be a trend from left to right, and so let's put one, 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 one on the other, one on the other, one on the other, like that. But then if you do it systematically, there could be another trend on another direction, right? Or it could be that uh, we're, th there, there's always many different variables. And so we need to apply the treatments at random, okay? Now, there's a third thing, and is that when you do it at random, um, let's, uh, let's imagine that there was some slope on that field, okay? And that the ones on top are on the top of the hill and the ones on the bottom are at, at the lowland, okay? So we have three paddocks and another three paddocks and another three paddocks, okay? Actually, the, because we know there is a slope, we know that there is a variable that we're not controlling really in the experiment but that we know is going to be affecting because probably the plots that are on the top of the hill are similar, more similar between them than the plots that are at the top of the hill versus the one on the lowlands, right? So the third principle of experimental design is local control. If you know there is some kind of reason, uh, some kind of factor that can be affecting your experimental units, block them, make them in, in, in groups, okay, and say, okay, we have this group, this other group, this other group. In this case, could be slope, or could be soil, or could be uh, different things, okay? And that way, we reduce 
the error, okay? It's because we're putting, uh, we're making sure that we have every treatment in every level of the, um, of that thing. So those are the three principles of experimental design. Uh, typical question in a prelim uh, in any natural science field uh, that you should be able to, to answer. Um, they were, they, I mean, this guy, a, a, a British guy, Sir, it was a, it was a, uh, how do you call them? A, a knight, right? Uh, Sir Fisher in 1935, and so he said, we need replication in order to measure the error, we need randomization in order to not bias our results, make sure that the errors are independent, and we need local control of variation or blocking to reduce that error. Those are the three principles. So in our experiment that we're gonna uh, be visiting now, um, that's what we did. Um, we have 10 plots that are marked with, with flags that you'll see, and uh, we block them, block one, two, three, four, five, and uh, we randomly assign the treatments of grazing continuous or grazing uh, rotational to those, to those plots, okay? And random means that we either flip a coin or we generated a random number or we dropped the numbers from a bag, we put one, two, three, four, five, ten, and we took one, okay? That sort of thing, random, okay? Yes? Well, no, the, the fact that we have, um, the, the thing is, we think that in this, um, in this area, let's say there, there is a slope, and so we think that these two plots that are in the block one are more similar between them than these two plots that are in lower, okay? So it's not a problem that they are touching each other, um, uh, no. Of course, the size of the plot matters because, I mean, in, in, if you're going to have cattle or if you're going to have different things, I mean, if the, if the treatment, like this, this, this has to be a large area so that the, um, the cattle grazing in this area is not really affecting the, this other side, right? If, if, if those were quadrats like this, you know, I mean, they would be affecting, you, you cannot really make a difference between cattle grazing here and cattle grazing there, right? So you need large, large plots, okay? We okay? So I mentioned last week we collected the forage and the meat uh, data, and this is what we got, okay? We went and for each of the 10 plots that each belong to one block, one, two, three, four, five. We had a treatment continuous or rotational, rotational continuous, whatever, and we measure the forage. In this case, for the forage, we went with quadrats like those. We put the quadrat, cut all the forage, put them in a bag, weigh it, um, put them in a dryer, weigh it dry, and uh, we got the mass of, of forage that was in each of those plots, okay? Um, for the meat, again, we weigh the animals at the beginning. They were one month inside the plot, we weigh the animals when they were out, and the difference is the meat produced, okay? Any questions on that? So, what do you think? Do you think that the continuous uh, is better or the rotational is better? Why? How do you see that? Okay, but it's, would, would you be convinced that by looking at that, you have better, more forage production in one, and, uh, and what about the meat production? I wouldn't be convinced. So, um, thank you. Uh, so we need to analyze and summarize this data, right? So one thing we do is we do the mean or the average, Okay, and as you were spotting, the continuous, the mean, the average of those five values we had, you know the average is, you know, we add up all the plots that had the continuous treatment, the five numbers, and we divide over five. Okay, that's the, that's the average or the mean. And we got 1,200 or, or 1,200 versus 2,000 in the rotational, okay? Uh, in the continuous, the mid production was 64 and 80 in the rotational. 
Uh, do you think that we can accept our hypothesis that rotational is better? Why not, Jorge? No, why not? Por qué no? What does that mean, that the differences are significant? Is it 2,000 not different than 1,200? So there is a deviation. There is some variability here. When we look at the continuous, yeah, it went from 1,000 to 1,400. And when we go at the rotational, it was 1,800 from 2,200, right? Um, so we're not sure if there are differences between the treatments. So then we do what is the, the, the you know, 99% of all these studies are, we do a, 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 a what is called the analysis of variance, an ANOVA, okay? And the ANOVA, what, what does really is ask the question, how much is the variability due to my treatments versus how much is the variability due to things that I didn't control? Okay, what is the variability between continuous versus rotational? And what is the variability between the blocks or the plots or, or other things that I didn't control? Okay, and it says, well, is the variability due to my treatments large enough to be considered significant? Okay, and that's when you say, well, yes, then there is an effect. So basically we had this, this the average here, it was 1200 and 2000. Okay, if we just compare that mean, it looks like they're different, but you don't know. And what the analysis of variance does is, uh, sorry, um, that was for forage productivity, okay? Does this graph, is okay? You all follow this graph? Um, now when we look at meat productivity, it was like 65 and, and 80, okay? Um, but what we do is we put all the plots here and we say, well, in the continuous grazing, we had this uh, data and in the rotational grazing, we had this data. So really the variability between this and this is much larger than the variability inside this group or the variability inside this group. So the analysis of variance will tell, yes, there are differences. The variability between continuous and, gra and, and rotational grazing is larger than the variability that you cannot explain, which is the variability between your replications. Is that clear? Now, when we go to the meat variable, we have this. It was the 60 versus the 65 versus the, the, the 80, I think. But you see that the variability here, it's kind of larger than, the, than this difference. See, I mean, I wouldn't feel comfortable saying that rotational grazing is always better than continuous grazing because you see there's a lot of times that they are the same. Hmm? So in this case, I wouldn't say that rotational grazing is better for meat production. I would say that rotational grazing produces more forage, but not really much meat. And that's what the analysis of variance does, okay? so. Basically, when you do the analysis of variance, uh, you end up with this kind of things with letters, and sometimes you see means with, with letters, okay? So when you have similar letters, like here, for, for the meat production, we have 64 and 80, but they have the same letter, meaning that they are not really different. They are not really statistically different. And when you have different letters here, like rotational A and continuous B, that means this difference is really statistically significant, okay? Any questions? Whatever you want. I mean, we, in this case, there are like 10 uh, steps wide because we just made them up. But I mean, usually in a grazing research, this would be like, you know, some, Half, an, uh, half a hectare or like larger areas or a hectare or something like that or more. It's not in the calculation. I, I just have five plots on one thing and five plots on the other. And, and I'm assuming that the area of the plot is good enough to measure in my variables, but the size of the plot doesn't go into the calculation. The, what goes in the calculation is the number of plots you have. Okay? 
So that's why, so, so you're in conclusion, for our first hypothesis, rotational grazing produces more forest and continuous grazing, yes. Uh, rotational grazing is producing more meat than continuous grazing, no, okay? I made all these numbers up, okay? So don't, con don't assume that this is the conclusion, okay? But I'm just trying to, um, so, so that's, that's why natural scientists are all the time looking for replications and are looking for uh, controlling the variability and are very interested in making sure we know what are the treatments and what is the error and what are the variables that we are controlling and what are the variables we're not controlling. Um, another thing that, that usually is done is, is can we see if there is any association between the two variables? Does producing more uh, forage also produces more meat. Can, can, we, can we look at the correlation between these two variables? And we usually run these uh, regressions, which are equations that describe the change in one variable due to a change in another variable. Um, and, and you normally see things like this. We put the forage productivity on the y, on the x axis. We put meat productivity on the y axis. And then you put uh, all the points you, you, you found in your data. And you try to see if there is any kind of association between y variable and x variable. In this case, when you run that regression line, um, you have a R square of 0.43. R square means what percent of the y variable is explained by the x variable. So what we have in this information is that 43% of the variab variability of meat production is explained by variability in forage production, okay? Um, which is not too much, uh, but you know, it, it, this is another type of analysis you normally can do. Yeah. Dependence and independence. Association is not associated with dependence and independence. This is an analysis of regression, no, no but association. You can say association in this case because it's yes, a relation. It's not association. Association is different to. So, so the, the regression tells you if the two, I mean, the, the regression coefficient tells you if these two variables are highly correlated or not, okay, which is um, the correlation is behind the regression, okay. But R squared is an indicator, but it's not an indicator of association. It's an indicator of how the independent variable is. Uh, explain the dependent variable is not an analysis of association. It's what I'm trying to say. It, this indicator is what, not. What an do you indicator. mean by association then? Association is the relation. Is um, um, I was trying to explain to you. Uh, if you have A and B are associated, the association between B and A are the same as the B and A. But if you are trying to understand uh, dependence and independence analysis is different the dependence between A and P yeah. and the P and A. In this case, this is not an association. In this case, it's a, a variable dependent and uh, independent and right. an independent variable. This is yeah. not a we, we still call it, I mean, it's a matter of what you call it. Association is whenever you, I mean, we're, when, whenever you have two variables and you calculate the correlation between them, you're looking at a linear association no. between them. So, so excuse me. But, but, uh, pero si quieres lo digo en español, pero eh, en la ley de asociación es, es, si tú tienes un conjunto A y B, la asociación entre A y B debe ser igual que la B A. La asociación no está, eh, no está explicada eh, con dependencia. O sí, sea, sí. cuando sabes si es una ley de relación... Lo que, lo, que estoy, hay... lo que estoy tratando de decir es que detrás de cualquier análisis de regresión hay un análisis de correlación antes. El R cuadrado es el cuadrado del coeficiente de correlación que es el R. Entonces, lo que es verdad es que cuando haces la regresión estás decidiendo cuál es la variable independiente y cuál es la variable dependiente y cuando haces la correlación no te importa cuál es cuál y simplemente decís están asociadas linealmente una con otra y da lo mismo porque el R es igual, ¿sí? El R cuadrado va a cambiar en función de cuál puse como X y cuál puse como Y. Ajá. Pero el análisis es el mismo en el fondo porque es... Lo que estamos viendo es si la varianza entre esta, siendo a, 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 la, a la base estadística, si la varianza entre la, una variable y la otra están asociadas o no. Si los puntos bajos de una se corresponden con puntos bajos de otra y si los puntos altos de una se corresponden con puntos altos de otra. One of the limitations really of this analysis is that it only looks at, at linear equations, but there could be association between variables and, and 
there are uh, other ways like quadratic or uh, exponential or other ways and so you have to be careful that not everything is associated in a linear way. Actually, most stuff is not associated in a linear way, maybe associated in many different ways, okay? Um, but I, I mean, I don't wanna get too much into the details. It's, it's just uh, uh, an example of a type of analysis that we're also doing, and it can also help you think when you're in your, in your groups. It's like, oh, these guys are thinking about if this variable relates to this other variable, and, and they need a bunch of numbers here in order to draw these lines, okay? As opposed to the example that Erin was telling at the beginning, it's like, okay, we talk with this person and we talk with this person and we think there might be some kind of uh, similar theme between what the things they said. Well, in order for us to say there is any association, we need a lot of numbers to run these this, uh, association studies or correlations. So what are the assumptions, yeah. But I haven't started with the assumptions. Are you already going to ask a question? <laughs> no, sorry. Sí, dale. Eh. Eh, pasa por el tema también de la experticia del investigador. Porque frecuentemente usted lee estudios y usted se pregunta, ¿por qué hacer el análisis de regresión? ¿Por qué hacer el análisis de correlación? ¿Qué sentido tiene en algunos momentos? Entonces, yo pienso que ese es un punto ni siquiera que es influyente, es determinante en la calidad de la persona que va a hacer el análisis, la experticia que tiene para que sea efectivo, porque en ocasiones usted ve un análisis que dice no hacía falta y en otro es muy necesario y no se hace. Por eso es un punto importante que el investigador tenga experticia y si no que se asesore de alguien que pueda dar un nivel de información para que tome un análisis adecuado y coherente. Sí, y yo creo que eso es, eso es muy importante. Es muy fácil correr análisis de regresión o asociación entre cualquier conjunto de variables y alguna siempre te va a dar alguna asociación. Y el punto es solo hacer análisis de cosas que tengan sentido, de que tenga sentido pensar que mayor, el aumento de una variable va a aumentar la otra o viceversa. Entonces no, no se puede eh, correr análisis de cualquier cosa y ver cuál, cuál da siempre. A ver. Um, so back to the assumptions that are behind this, this way of doing research. Um, one is empiricism. We believe only data that we can uh, censor, whether it's uh, touch or see or measure with a ruler or measure with a scale or measure with some way. Um, the, that, that's not um, things that, you know, somebody told me, okay. Uh, positivism, the, the, the fact that we think that there is a real world out there and that we can, um, we can know it, yeah? Antris? Empiricism and empirical data ah, I don't know if there's a difference to me it's the same it's Is like the same? using empirical information using information from the from out there from the real world uh, to learn to, to generate knowledge okay is that sounds good enough um, we believe that there's cause effect relationships that that's that's a basic assumption of this is that if we change some variables, that's gonna cause that other variables will change. In this case, if we change the management of the grazing, we will have different uh, forage production or whatever. Um, it is reductionist in the sense that we are breaking reality into parts and we do these experiments that we control one or two or three variables, but we don't control everything because we can't, it's impossible. And so uh, we can only say, okay, if everything is the same and you change the management of the grazing, then you'll get more forage production, okay? But in reality, never everything is the same. So there's, okay, what happened if it didn't rain? You get the same results. What happened in a soil that's sandier? or what happened in a warmer climate, or what happened if the animals, instead of being cows, were sheep, or what happened, you know, and there's 
and those are different experiments that you can do but you always go one by one okay you you don't go all together at the same time so we we keep breaking the reality into pieces um, it's based on this idea of repeatability okay that if we do this experiment again in the same conditions we'll get the same results um, again objectivity the researcher should not be changing or affecting or biasing the, 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 the method. So anybody who does this, doesn't matter the age or the race or the political orientation or the uh, religion, would get the same results. Um, we use this hypothesis, which is a guide, you know, something that we want to either accept or reject, and, and we use it as a, as a guide. Uh, and it's within uh, a paradigm. It's, it's, it's within a set of understanding that, well, cattle, in this case, let's say cattle graze plants and plants grow. And if the cattle uh, gr uh, uh, eat the plants in a way, the plants may respond in this way. And there's a lot of physiology and botany and, and, and genetics and whatever involved into understanding that. And, and if we find something that really doesn't fit uh, all that paradigm, we tend to say, well, maybe I did it, the experiment wrong. Okay, and so that's one of the problems with this is that it's really difficult to, to challenge the, the, the way things are, 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 uh, are thought. Um, and so one of the things that happens is that you want you you're you're interested in showing the benefits of your method or your management practice or your new technology or whatever and if if you get good results you trust them if you get that there's no difference and you say well maybe this wasn't done right and we shouldn't publish it or and and that's something that that happens uh, quite a bit um, and then we one way that we try to integrate this is uh, putting those equations that we find, those numbers, those parameters into, into equations and models, and we try to simulate scenarios and say, well, that means that if we did this experiment like this way, but now we have more paddocks, maybe we would have more production or whatever. Um, but it's a, it's a method that really isn't very good at finding you know, emergent properties or understanding interactions and all that, and that's why we need other approaches. Um, to interact here. Um, so hopefully this sort of clarified a little bit some of what are, what are some of the methods that are using natural science and, and it would help you understand some of the discussions you'll have or you already have in your, in your groups. Um, we have some time for, for questions still um, and then we're going out to the field to measure some of these, uh, these things in the field. So. Questions, comments? Yes. So based on the premise that uh, we don't trust people, but actually it's people conducting this research or these exercises, how, how do you test this objectivity? How is that done? Do you replicate the same exercise conducted by different experts? So to test that they, they really get to the same results? Yeah, that's, that's, that's really good. So part is the replication within your treatments. Part is rep repetition of the same experiment in different locations, in different countries, in different situations. And, and, and you find in the literature that you know, this experiment was done several times in many places, and that's good. Although it's funny because if, if, if you're trying to apply for a grant and you say, I'm going to replicate exactly the same experiment that somebody else did, then you won't get funded. But it's the basis of the scientific method that you have to replicate it in order to make sure that you get the same thing, right? Um, and, and then the other thing is uh, part, it's at ex post when you submit your publications, you get reviewers uh, who look at your methods and say, well, this really is the same as people have been doing it before and agrees or not. Or so, so there is that part of, you know, more social construction of like looking at what people did before and and the reviewers who look at your work right now um, yeah Harry? Thanks. 
Since we're a uh, transdisciplinary group and thinking about and non-scientists or non-academics into the process, um, do you believe that they can be brought into this process or that citizen science can follow these same steps if they're not trained as academic scientists? Um, well, I, I, I do think that in the, in the, the there's, a, there's a very important role of, of non-scientists in providing, framing the, the, the experiment. When you're, when you're um, considering the experiment and, and you're considering the, the, the variables here, um, if, you, if you talk to farmers, if you talk to other people who are not scientists, they will tell you what are the variables you're missing that you should be considering, okay? Well, yeah, but you're saying continuous versus rotational, but not all continuous grazing is the same because if, if you have one cow continuously grazing in you know, this size of, of, the, of, of the area, it's gonna be different than you have two cows or three cows, so there might, so it's not only the continuous versus rotational, but it's like, what's the stocking rate? How many animals per hectare? Or, yeah, but I know that that works in that region where they have deep soils, but when, where we are here and they are very shallow soils, there's no response to grazing because there's no grass growing anyways. And so there's a role of, of you know, non-scientists to help you identify what are the variables you need to be considering in your experiment and if the whole experiment makes sense or if, should, you should, if your blocks, for instance, you should think of blocks that consider part of those variables as, as part of the variability, okay? Um, that's one thing. The other thing is that we're very strict about the experiments that we do in really small areas, like, you know, a couple hectares or maybe a couple dozen of hectares, uh, but there's a lot of information that's generated by farmers and, I mean, in this case, but, but maybe from by, by other people, going back to the citizen science, that has value. I mean, it's not generated with everything under control, but we never generate everything with everything under control. So if, if you can come up with enough of a large database and you, are, you have good information about what are the variables that you can be controlling, I mean, you could use... Uh, and, and we do use a lot of information from farmers that are not from experiments that are relevant to answering these type of questions. I don't know if that helps, yeah. Other questions or comments? Es un deber académico como docente. Eh, simplemente aclarar eso. Eh, eh, yo sé que no está el caso, pero sí me parece importante. Eh, el tema de la regresión sí es diferente a análisis de estudiación. Y el coeficiente que estabas mostrando es un coeficiente de determinación, no un coeficiente de correlación. El coeficiente de determinación explica que tanto las variables independientes explican la dependiente, pero es decir, es eh, importante la claridad conceptual de la diferencia entre... Pero, pero precisamente el... Análisis de asociación o correlación, que es lo mismo, lo que usa es un coeficiente que se llama R minúscula, que es el coeficiente de correlación, que es el R sí, minúscula. Sí, exacto. El análisis de regresión es el mismo análisis, ¿sí? lo único que tú decidiste que una variable es dependiente y otra es independiente, y el R lo multiplicas al cuadrado, lo multiplicas por 100, y obtienes el coeficiente de determinación, que es el R cuadrado por 100, que es el que te indica el porcentaje de la variación de la variable Y explicada por la variable X. Cuando haces análisis de asociación no hay variable dependiente e independiente. No, claro, por eso, la única, es lo que estoy diciendo, la diferencia entre el análisis de asociación, que es el de correlación, y el análisis de regresión, es que en el análisis de regresión tú decides, esta es mi variable dependiente y, en est y esta es la independiente. Oh. En el otro, las dos son X1, X2, y ninguna tiene, eh, busca explicar una o la otra. Bueno, podemos discutir Pero matemáticamente después, pero... es lo mismo. Eh, es un tema conceptual más allá de una... Pero bueno, podemos discutirlo después. Digamos, yo enseño esto y, y no, no, no... Sí, sí, yo no. también. Entonces, bueno. Eh, lo, lo sustancial, creo más, porque realmente no es, no es muy importante la diferencia. Lo sustancial acá es ver dónde está lo que tú quieres inferir. Entonces, en un caso, en el análisis de correlación, tú estás viendo si hay una asociación, si las dos variables, cuando una aumenta, la otra aumenta, pero 
sin asignarle causalidad, diciendo esta aumenta, esta otra aumenta, pero no sabemos si una es responsable de la otra o las dos simplemente se mueven juntas. Y en el de regresión, tú decides, tú lo diseñas el análisis porque quieres ver si al variar una variable cambia la otra. Entonces, es diferente el tipo de respuestas que puedes tener. Algo de, sobre eso que creo que es interesante y puede, o sea, que el hecho de que, o sea, de algo que puede ser una coincidencia entre ambos métodos es la posibilidad de presentar suficiente evidencia como para que alguien pueda revisar tus resultados. So, uh, that's reliability for both, right? Both methods. So, you provide as much evidence as as much methodological decisions decisions to your reader so so you can have this kind of conversation which is something that both methods share so yeah naomi referring to the question someone over here asked earlier Aaron, Aaron sorry uh, Aaron asked about engaging with stakeholders and their ability to frame these studies or at least understand them. Um, I think with indigenous uh, communities, at least in Canada, researchers such as your, like yourself, um, but maybe more on the wildlife side of things than the ecosystem side of things, they have worked cooperatively to actually develop the questions um, around what's happening, for example, to different species of wildlife One of the things I've heard from some of the presentations I've seen is that local people sometimes know more about the immediate dynamics of that area. Uh, let's say, you know, how many animals are surviving, how many look like they're sick, um, if the young are the same, you know, in the herds or what, that kind of thing. But they don't often understand the external dynamics very well, like the way the atmosphere is affecting things or if the ocean flows or river flows are different or um, if there are pollutants seeping in from external areas. So I think that's one gift that people like yourself can really give uh, local people when you're working on these projects is to help them understand you may have been able to rely on just your local indicators 30 years ago but there's so many external forces at play now that we can help you understand those.